Hi, good afternoon. And welcome to the third installment of the Transformations of the Human Researcher Lecture Series at the Bergeron Institute. My name is Tui Schaub, and I'm the Associate Director of the Transformations of the Human Program. And as most of you probably know by now, TOF studies the effects of AI and biotech, of the digital and the vital, on the modern concept of the human as more than nature and other than machine. In today's lecture, Toft researcher Gabriel Koren will focus on the cluster he leads with Nina Bagush that we alternately call the hearth, referring to how to, to be human in terms of the whole earth, the planetary and replacing technology with biology. I'm delighted to introduce Nina, who will moderate and lead Q&A after Gabriel's talk. Thank you all very much for joining us. Nina, please go ahead. Hi, this is Nina. Um, I'm a recent PhD in comparative literature from Harvard. And like our speaker today, I'm a part of the biotechnology research cluster within the transformations of the human program. Um, I'm based in the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory with Owen Brody's team, where I focus on microbiome research and biogeochemistry of earth systems. And it's my pleasure to introduce my closest colleague today, Gabriel Koren. Gabriel um, holds a PhD in cultural anthropology from the University of California, Berkeley. And in his dissertation titled New Materials for Life, he chronicled how chemical and life scientists fabricate novel forms of living matter for biotechnology and medicine. Um, if you're interested to read more about this, I recommend reading his article recently published in Biosocieties titled Life Inter Vivos. Gabriel is also an editor with the History of Anthropology Review. And as a transformation of the human researcher, he conducts field work at the Stanford Department of Bioengineering with Drew Andy's team of synthetic biologists. Gabriel also leads our weekly Grotto meetings. And under Tobias's guidance, um, Gabriel and I are composing a catalog of philosophical works that have shaped the conceptual history of nature in European thought. And besides all that, Gabriel also started conversations with a few biotech companies of which he'll be talking about today. So all Gabriel's projects um, have a common focus on a planetary whole earth perspective, or as we call it, hearth, that is human and earth approach to biotechnology and the human, in which we're trying to consider them both not as separated from nature, but as integrated into nature. And this is a new perspective to biological sciences and engineering that opens many philosophical questions and possible venues for a new practice. Thank you so much, um, Nina. Thank you very much for the warm introduction. Let me please um, put a portion of my screen to share with you. Uh, perfect, okay. So, As a new researcher with the Bergeron Institute's Transformation of the Human Program, I'm working with Nina and uh, others to develop a research cluster, which is a suite of coordinated and collaborative research projects that are connected by a shared set of themes, questions, and problems. The Institute has several new and ongoing research clusters centered around the domains of artificial intelligence, machine learning, algorithmic design, and robotics. And now under the framing of biotechnology and the human today, Toth wishes to expand its reach by charting a course of research that will bring the stakes of contemporary biotechnologies to bear upon our concepts of the human and nature today by casting the transformational possibilities of our present age into both historical and philosophical relief. The problem space to which the research I'm currently conducting most broadly attends is whether reconceptualizing biotechnology today could lead not only to a rethinking of what being human is or could become, but to a reshaping of our human practices 
as engineers, scientists, artists, and scholars tomorrow in a time when our current practices are increasingly understood to be unsustainable, to put it politely. The starting premise for my research with Top then is that biotechnology is not what it used to be. At the least, it need not be. With the invention of recombinant DNA in the early 1970s, technical capacities for manipulating and modifying living matter acquired a higher degree of precision than previously before. In the decades since, the mobilization of living matter of, and living nature for instrumental human ends has increased inexorably and much of biology has been refashioned to function in terms of the modern concept of technology that is as artificial as an exclusively human invention, an object of human control, an extension of human dominion, biotechnology as a sort of cultural prosthesis. Turn to technological, biological parts and processes today are exploited for their application to ever expanding ranges of human practices and products from the domains of medicine, agriculture, and war to the fibers, fuels, and pharmaceutical industries. In human terms, technologizing biology has permitted certain people to profit and propelled a proliferation of consumer products. From a planetary perspective, however, the earth as a living environment unremittingly deteriorates even as, or perhaps all the more that, our biotechnological achievements continually accrue. It's in this light that the unifying frame for the transformations of the human research cluster that we are developing is called the hearth, a term in which a division of the human from the earth, at least in part, collapses. How can we cultivate ways to think the human, traditionally conceived in modern terms as the sole purveyor of culture, technology, and artifice, and the earth, traditionally conceived as the domain of nature or of non-technological process, as mutually imbricated, each a part of the other and enveloped in a collective embrace? In what fields of contemporary human practice and technical knowledge might we find stimulants for the invention of a planetary perspective that is an orientation through which to forge a radically different relationship between ourselves as humans and the earthen terrestrial milieu we inhabit with so many other beings, entities, elements, and forces. With this impetus, Always in mind, our preliminary researchers for this cluster have focused upon three candidate domains, synthetic biology and bioengineering, the biogeochemistry of earth system science, and microbiome research and related scientific exploration. We believe that these nascent fields present us with possibilities for radically challenging that well-worn and widespread regime of biotechnology that has prevailed since the 1970s a regime which has principally sought to make biology into technology. Perhaps these new domains will come to offer us the possibility for provoking conceptual rupture from our techno-modernistic present, a rupture we envision as at first proceeding from a profound reversal of the terms we have inherited from our predecessors and which continue to organize our ideas about what biotechnology is and could be. The reversal of terms we envision from the technologizing of biology to the biologization of technology. And biologizing technology means biotechnologies in which biology replaces technology. Now, one philosophical challenge of forging a whole earth point of view is the conceptual elaboration upon and later the aesthetic expression of what we're calling provisionally a planetary perspective which in the transformations of the human program terminology could be said to be a perspective with which to precipitate current as well as to propel future transformations of the human and nature and technology. A foundational precept that guides the work conducted across TOPS programming, as you know, is that the modern assumptions we've inherited about the human nature, living matter and technology remain largely unexamined today. A foundational feature of these assumptions, and there are many, is that the human and nature are separate entities, defined in fact in contradistinction to one another, and that technology, conceived as the domain of the artificial, is relegated to the sphere of the human, 
while living matter is by and large categorically approached as a special class of phenomena belonging to the sphere of nature. As I was coming on board at the Berggruen Institute, the director of Toth, Tobias Ries had just published a provocative essay about what he termed the microbiocene in Noema, the Berggruen Institute's literary magazine. In the essay, Ries took up the COVID-19 pandemic in order to demonstrate how the modern concept of politics is predicated upon this near total bifurcation of the human from nature and is accompanied by a corollary extrication of the anthropological or human domain from the cosmological order, um, what we might call the atmospheric today, and a subsequent separation of human affairs from non-human or natural ones. Our modern inheritance then truly is a point of view that positions the human as outside of nature, as more than nature. That essay powerfully opens up the philosophical space that our new hearth cluster seeks to address for the continuation of an unquestioned separation of the human from non-human entities and affairs, technology from nature is unsustainable. Enter hearth. What form ought we to give to a new configuration of the human in hearth terms? At least one which upends, reimagines, and finally abandons the modern form of politics that performs the human's ascendancy over nature, the form of manufacture, post-industrial revolution that performs the human's mastery over nature through extracting value from it without reciprocation. And certainly, and particularly for us in the hearth cluster of biotechnology of the human, one that abandons the modern form of technology or concept of it as the means or media through which human beings maintain their separation from and even so primacy over other natures through practices that channel the power of the artificial. As an accompaniment to the hearth cluster site research projects, which I'll address momentarily, Nina, Tobias, and I have been analyzing the history of the Western concept of nature from the ancients to the moderns to today, as Nina mentioned. And we're constructing a catalog from which to chart the periodic points of epistemological rupture that have conditioned transformations to the notion of nature throughout history. And one observation that we already observe over and again, particularly as the modern period matures, is that whenever the notion of nature transforms, so too do the concepts of human, as well as of technology. This historical investigation applies to the Hearth Research Cluster's current work because it's priming us to learn to recognize the conditions under which conceptual ruptures are potentially ushered to the fore by new approaches to making knowledge about the human and nature in particular, and new uses or conceptualizations of technology more generally as well. And we believe this is going to help us and as an aid as we examine the potential transformations to the human and technology and nature that we see emerging alongside the engineering practices and scientific perspectives that the Hearth Cluster is exploring today. So a reminder, Mr. Synthetic Biology, Biogeochemistry of Earth Science Systems and Microbiome Research. So I'll first start by talking about synthetic biology. The primary research project I'm spearheading revolves around synthetic biology. And I have joined the lab of Drew Endy at Stanford University's Department of Bioengineering to do so. Much of the lab's work is devoted to build cell efforts, the primary purpose of which is to engineer novel forms of cellular life and from the ground up if possible. They desire operational mastery of living matter, which does convey with it something of the classically modernist engineering approach to nature. And that mastery could be interpreted as carrying that trope of control. Yet the concepts of living matter, of nature and of natural process and of technology that are implicit to the synthetic biologist actual practices and designs appears already to me to belie the dominant man, the engineer as master of nature framing that the bulk of many other of today's biotechnologists have unreflexively inherited from our engineering predecessors. With Drew and all the members of his lab, there's such an abundance of, of playfulness and, and humility, and also an interest in collaborating 
with biological parts and processes. And as they guide me into the world of synthetic biology, we're beginning now to think seriously together how mastery could be pursued without an attitude of control, but rather uh, by forging a spirit of collaboration with living matter. And these conversations are blowing my mind. The field work I'm currently conducting among synthetic biologists sensibly flows from my prior research among my biomaterial scientists and tissue engineers, which Nina mentioned. Um, from the physics that this group at Stanford are inventing to model multiple scales of cellular function to their experiments with fail-safe genetic modifications to engineered life forms, to their thinking about approaches to directed evolution of de novo life, to their approach to genomic and molecular knowledge as a toolkit rather than a bl blueprint for the living. I'm really starting to culture a sense for their sense of the relations, not merely those that are actual, but more so the ones that are possible and could come to exist among the living and material worlds. It's an inspiring entry into theirs. Now, prior more academic anthropological studies of synthetic biology and bioengineering have usually either critiqued or just lionized synthetic biology to court. One study that's pretty famous aimed at an intervention into precisely the engineering ethos that the first wave of synthetic biology accelerated in the life sciences. And it offered a pointed critique of the manner in which engineers initially endeavored to externalize biological complexities like regulation and dynamisms like evolution from their approaches to living matter. It's an apt account. However, just like biological beings, bioengineering practices also evolve. For that's precisely what Drew and his synthetic biologist lab members are exploring today. Complexity, dynamisms like evolution, and importantly, how to engineer with living matter in conditions of uncertainty, where unknowns both biological and technical abound. That's not, to my mind, a simple engineering ethos seeking control, but an experimental and playful pursuit of the possible from the actual. And that is one of their most concrete and inspiring philosophical contributions to my thinking yet, that nature could have made so many things, but these ones, the extant forms, that's what it's produced, a drop in the bucket. Why not learn from nature to experimentally bring into, to bring experimentally into being, beings it has not formed what could have? That's what they're teaching me. And this forces us to philosophically reckon with the fact that nature is always changing it isn't static, that it's impermanent, involutionary. So why not face forward rather than salvage the past when we design with living technologies, when we tinker with as a way of facing nature's um, most profound phenomena? Another or second academic study of a different kind unabashedly extolled synthetic biology for its capacity to re-ontologize living nature as a human fabrication, as something made artificial, technological. It was an account that unquestioningly reinscribed bioengineering as a technophilic human practice, a framing that not only accepts but deepens the separation of the milieu of the human as technician and scientist, to quote George Congium, from the living and natural worlds which is precisely the gulf that our current research with transformations of the human aims to delineate, diagnose, and depart from. Rather, the approach I'm taking to synthetic biology is different, for I don't wish to study synthetic biologists as objects of human scientific inquiry. Instead, I'm working to historicize both past and present bioengineering practices while imagining possible futures with synthetic biologists as collaborating subjects. If I'm coming to view them as beginning to engineer with biology rather than engineering of biology, which is a crucial distinction, then this research, mu research must at once aim to investigate the philosophical prospects of bioengineering with synthetic biologists. For we wanna know if engineering with biology were to re-render engineering into natural terms, or at least in terms of natural processes, despite the objects of their endeavors being human made. What could it mean then to be an engineer tomorrow? How might a seismic shift in perspective, one which takes up engineering as a human science and biotechnology as a subject of natural history, recast what it is to be human into hearth 
or planetary terms. With that focus in mind, Andy and I have commenced a working group, virtual for now, called the Hearth Grotto. We've brought synthetic biologists, scholars from the humanities and social sciences, including Nina, and artists together to query these questions, to search for instances of biology replacing technology, and to collectively imagine expressive forms for representing their distinctiveness from prevailing biotechnology, which to repeat, overwhelmingly tend to take form through an engineering approach that technologizes biological function, process, or entities. And together in Grotto, we are beginning to attempt to truly aim to imagine a bioengineering practice that would proceed in terms of a collaboration with rather than control over living nature. That's a challenge for us all. And I think one that's already becoming a pleasurable and becoming pleasurable and also a shared prospect of discovery together. When it comes to fostering innovation or catalytically transforming present research practices, the modern university as an institution has limitations. The so-called social human life and physical or natural sciences acquired their current contours over the course of the long 19th century. And in the final decades of the 19th century up through the first quarter of the 20th, the modern sciences codified around a set of what has since become their traditional objects, life, society, culture, political economy, history, the mind, geography, et cetera, you know them. Engineering, which had in North America at least began as a branch of the military, think about artillery making, naval vessel design, and barracks building, for example, only gained steam as a civil oriented profession in the mid 19th century, vital as it was to be for westward settler expansionism, the development of transportation infrastructures like railroads and canals, urban design, mining, and oil extraction. The first engineering schools of the early and mid 19th century shared key organizational features with and were influenced by the French polytechnical model. Think on Ray Puncare for one. Engineering only began to become integrated into American universities after the passage of the first Morrill Act in the 1860s, and even more so the second passage in the 1890s. So it was that in the first decades of the 20th century, engineering in the university grew increasingly entangled with theoretical physics, structural mechanics, electrokinetics, colloidal physics, and fluid dynamics. And of course, at that same time, the training of physicians and standard medical school programs and curricula took their institutional shape as well. From the point of view of its structure and its organization, the university today is little changed from the form it had taken by the beginning of World War II. Overall, the university has remained divided up into the trifecta of the faculties of science, engineering, and the arts, which includes the humanities. These are accompanied by professional schools for law and medicine, and later they were joined by schools for business or finance too. What change has obtained over the 20th century has had far less to do with the general structure of the university and, and more to do with the organization of expertise according to narrowed subjects of focus and methodological standards. That is, it's a story of ever increasing specialization. Within each faculty, disciplines proliferated followed by sub-disciplines and sub-specializations. Things remain today as they did before. I know I just came from it. Yet the division of the university faculties have become second nature somehow, and the objects of study to which each is oriented are approached as if ontologically distinctive. The human and human matters over here, nature and natural phenomena over there with engineering, as equipped as it is with technological inventions, perhaps mediating at times between the two. The Faculty of Arts with its social sciences and humanities discourses the domain of the human, the figure of which remains classically rendered as more than nature, what with its culture, history, politics, art, ideas, its morals and values. The faculty of science with its physical, chemical and life sciences discovers and describes the dominion of nature, still traditionally understood as the phenomena that unfold absent of human intention or technological intervention. As, as, as I've observed them so far, Drew Endy and the students in his lab at Stanford have created a haven within the university where the limitation of the university's separation of the faculties do not entirely reach, where interdisciplinary interest, playful experimentation and uncompromising curiosity brim with abundance. 
Drew has remarked, as have other innovators working in the sciences and engineering divisions of many other university systems as well, that play is all too often given a backseat to utility when it comes to experimental forays into novel scientific domains. This is a constraint of the division of the faculties in university institutions, the ones I outlined above, but it is felt with particular acuteness by those at the intersections of life science and engineering for it's adjoined by another even more forceful institutional constraint, albeit one that's exterior to the university, despite being deeply felt by all those who dwell within it, funding. As a kind of moralistic neoliberal yardstick, utility is shorthand for the prospective impact of a research project may yield through the application of its findings to already agreed upon problems or to the poten its potential for an experimental inventions translation for uh, integration with or incorporation into existing infrastructures, aptitudes, or problem spaces. Since the ascendancy of big science and the codification of global biomedical research initiatives on an international scale, as the greatest influences that structure where, what, and to whom extensive investiture into biological engineering and the academy is channeled, the limits to what can happen in university settings are relatively set. Now, the creativity, play, and curiosity that courses through the build to cell projects in Drew's labs are inspirational as instances of resisting this incessant instant, insistent, insistence for raw utility of research as well as the restrictive grip of external funding structures for research support. He encourages the transformational potential of playful engineering pursuits amongst his PhDs and their build to sell forays are a testament to the value of their efforts, to the effect of the kind of environment they've managed to harbor within the university's bounds. The commercial realm, particularly of startup companies, partakes of its own institutional limitations as well as funding ones. However, Biotech startups offer transformations of the human nascent venues in which transformations not only to engineering practices, but transformations to the image idea and orientation of engineering itself can be collectively imagined, but possibly materialized in practice anew. Therefore, under the umbrella of transformation of the humans, biotechnology and the human program, the new hearth cluster seeks to pursue this challenge in partnership with startups in the commercial domain. We're beginning to share our whole earth vision for biotech with potential collaborators. The crux of this vision is that together with the engineers and scientists who are fashioning distinctively new forms of biotechnology at these companies, we can one, elaborate a philosophical concept of natural technology or technology as biology. Two, encourage the curation of new receptions of and experiences with biotechnology among the broader public. Three, explore ways to rethink the modern idea of engineering itself. And four, perhaps become co-participants in Toth's broader philosophical project to inspire the invention of new engineering practices. Already with Drew Endy through the Hearth Grotto on the one hand, and with Nina Begus and Tobias Ries through our concept work on the history of the idea of nature on the other, we have commenced exploring ways to rethink the modern idea of engineering, the notion that engineering has always been about some uniquely human power to mobilize the artificial as a means, either for maintaining control over or else masking the human beings enmeshment with nature. Nature as an A or sometimes anti-technological out there. But as Nina and I endeavor to catalog the genealogy of European conceptions of nature, technology, and the human, from the ancients to today, it's increasingly clear just how recent, contingent, and entirely unobligatory our everyday conception of engineering today truly is. Without the modern notion of nature as the other than human domain on the one hand, and without a corollary ontological separation of human beings from other living beings, of humans from machines, of man-made technologies from natural processes on the other, the idea of engineering as a uniquely human provenience begins to appear as arbitrary as it is limiting. From the perspective of the hearth, imagining alternatives to the unsustainable idea of engineering that we have inherited from 19th century industrialists is an urgent task, perhaps more than ever before. 
just look at 2020. So it is that the engineers who we observe to be biologizing technology before our very eyes, who are innovating ways to engineer with nature and who are inventing biological beings that could in principle have been produced by nature and yet were not, they are the obvious practitioners in our present with whom to imagine possible futures for a whole earth engineering practiced from a planetary perspective. At this preliminary phase, we've initiated conversations with three companies with which we hope to develop collaborative projects. To be very clear, these conversations are in their early stages of development, but we're also very hopeful about the prospects of each potential partnership. I will explain why each of these companies is so promising for the Hearth Cluster's ambitions and offerings shortly, but first, the companies we have initiated conversations about future projects with are First, Anthea, second, Twist Bioscience, and third, MycoWorks. It's our hope that should these partnerships proceed, they will serve as exemplary instances, incubators, if you will, of the prospects of biotechnology companies adopting a hearth point of view towards their practices and their products, of coming to see themselves not merely as makers of marketable tech innovations, but as architects of philosophical events as well. Each of these three potential collaborators in the commercial realm is distinctive and therefore the projects that Toft is aiming to develop with each company will be distinct as well. But there are two threads in particular that tie these together from a hearth point of view. The first thread is technological and the second is thematic. First, the technological thread. Each is a site in which biotechnological products or engineering practices inspired by synthetic biology are materializing and at an industrial and therefore highly impactful and publicly visible scale. Second, the thematic thread. That from our vantage, each of these companies presents to Toth's researchers a venue of unparalleled promise for we hold the conviction that each of these companies can become vehicles for showcasing how living nature can be concretely leveraged for replacing technology with biology today. With humility, we envision Anthea, Twist Bioscience, and MycoWorks becoming incubators for the Hearth Cluster's mission to invent a planetary point of view. We hope that sustained engagement between Toth and each of these commercial partners will generate communal cross-sectoral aspirations to reconfigure biotech through the integration of nature with technology and of human being with both living being and with the broader material world an integration all the while trained towards the enrichment of the earth and its innumerable inhabitants from the organismal to the elemental and beyond. To repeat once more for emphasis, each of these candidate companies offer an opportunity to articulate the philosophical prospects of biotechnology and the human today. They show the necessity of fashioning engineering practices that replace technology with biology and they exemplify the hearth attitude by endeavoring to engineer collaboratively with nature rather than attempting to control it. First, by way of introduction, I will describe the products and practices these companies present to the world. Next, I'll take them up each individually in order to draw out the philosophical ramifications of what they're doing by casting their works into hearth terms. Then I'll highlight some interconnections that the cluster currently conceives among them. Um, and towards the end, uh, several of them will reappear um, with a different valence uh, for a, a, a speculative pursuit that we're not currently working on, but I might like to share with y'all uh, pertaining to the arts. So, Anthea, Twist Bioscience and Michael Works are all Bay Area startups that are not only engineering with biology, but are truly replacing technology with biology as well. At Anthea, Synthetic biologists have metabolically modified brewer's yeasts, genetically engineered plant enzymes to function, functionally perform as biosynthesis pathways within these most common of unicellular fungal creatures. Having harnessed synthetic biology to accomplish this feat that one science writer recently cast as a quote, groundbreaking technological breakthrough quote, one of the most complex synthetic metabolic pathways presented ever in the scientific literature, end quote. 
The bioengineers at Anthea can now, with just a little bit of sugar as an energy source for their microbiological creations, sit back and watch as their yeasts ferment medicinally relevant molecules on demand. At Michaelworks, mycelium networks, i.e. mushrooms, are mobilized together with just a little bit of wood shaving and water as sources of energy to manufacture materials that substitute for, and frankly, even supersede the versatility of luxury leathers and other materials employed in um, the, the, the fashion and wearable worlds. And Twist Bioscience, which is currently the single largest commercial producer and supplier of synthetic DNA in the world, has partnered with Microsoft and the Molecular Information Systems Lab at the University of Washington to create a synthetic DNA-based platform for encoding and storing digital data. As the CEO of Twist put it, from the practical point of view, quote, with proof of concept achieved for DNA as a digital data storage media, we are working to drive down the cost of synthesizing DNA to enable its potential as a widely available commercial solution for the growing body of precious data in digital format, such as archival data, financial and health record backups, and all the long-term data retention where current media is not practical, end quote. And her co-founder cast the storage of digital data and synthetic DNA into truly philosophical terms, which resonate with a hearth point of view when they said, DNA is, quote, nature's informational media. Between microbially fermented medicines and mycologically manufactured textile materials, these two cases alone showcase the possibilities of a biotechnology reconceptualized as a biology that replaces technology. Between these two companies, there's held the prospect to literally ferment a fungal future in which the fashion and the pharmaceutical industries could become entirely abended. I mean, what is it to even imagine a future in which the deleterious effects of industrial manufacture, of global supply chains, of extraction economies, of indefensibly wasteful land and human labor usage and resource depletion to both humans and the earth were interrupted or even reversed? to conceive through ethical engineering in collaboration with living nature, microbial synthesis of drugs on the one hand, mycological vertical farming, for example, of consumer wearables on the other, of a biotechnology as a crucible for concretely resting our industrial means of production away from global chemical corporations, instead recentering these within multi-species and truly multi-species communities or collectivities. You know, Fordism perfected the factory form in the early 20th century, but could microorganismal bioreactors come to replace factories with community fermentation in the second quarter of the 21st? Could vertical fungal farming with mushrooms come to replace large-scale livestock husbandry, animal processing facilities, and chemotoxic tanneries? Could synthetic DNA, a biology-based medium, replace silicon as the primary physical depository for the storage of ever increasing volumes of data. Just think about also, you know, to the materiality of the cloud, the water, the energy, the, the land usage, and the security risk. That's the outline for the kind of whole earth vision that the hearth cluster would hope to further by partnering with these companies and, and pursuing projects that would cast their biotechnology platforms into philosophical relief. And if I may briefly, um, please pronounce upon a personal note, which is that um, I can hardly express how rousingly stimulative these first few months at the Berggruen Institute's Tuft program have been for me, having arrived here freshly from the academy following from a decade of graduate training in the interpretive social sciences. Perhaps the most yielding of the private insights I've gained while thinking with Tobias, Nina, Drew, Tui, the members of the ND Lab at Stanford, Mara Eagle, and others in our Tuft network about how to design a scholarly research program that rigorously engages contemporary intersections of engineering with the experimental earth and life sciences, but which also tacks back and forth between the adjacent academic and commercial sites in which its most ambitious and creative biotechnological entrees are at present pursued. 
I mean, I certainly think that scholars situated in the academy, along with university educators, must continue to articulate their discursive critiques of capitalism, their analyses of increasing inequality, of alarming, of alarm ringing rates of runaway climate change, what have you. But, but by creating ways to engage commercial actors and artists and an interested educated public in addition to interlocutors in the academy, I'm coming to see what an open opportunity we have to shape non-discursive realms of contemporary knowledge and practice as well. As a steward for Toth's hearth, I hope this research cluster decisively demonstrates that a newfangled notion of biotechnology really could shift us away from our current corporate model of chemo capitalism towards a biology-based, community-oriented model of distributed manufacture. But doing so will no doubt require a concomitant shift to the self-conception of engineers who create biotechnology for commercial ends. If they could, and I believe that with us they will, come to conceive their innovations not only as means for example, making less costly medicines or as methods for procuring less environmentally egregious textiles, but rather as epistemological events, then perhaps science studies scholars like me and philanthropic think tanks like BI will have just concretely contributed to the reshaping of some of the most historically deleterious of anthropogenic practices. This fact of our shared focus amidst others at this institute inspires me. Now I want to just talk for a moment about, I've been talking about synthetic biology, bioengineering. I want to talk a little bit about um, the work that Nina is spearheading and uh, with the earth, biogeochemistry of earth system science and, and to show or round out how these are the sort of uh, twin poles of our um, opening forays uh, in, into, into um, forging a hearth uh, view towards, towards the people and the planet as integrated. So, for the earth sciences side of the hearth research cluster, Nina Begus is commencing an exploratory collaboration with the Owen Brody lab at the Lawrence Berkeley National, sorry, one second. Great. With the Owen Brody lab at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory of UC Berkeley. The Brody lab takes a biogeochemistry approach to earth system science. Their aim is to invent experimental methods with which to predictively model the future dynamics of multiscalar, interactive, and highly heterogeneous Earth systems. To do so, the general unit of analysis that the Brody Lab has taken up is the watershed system of systems. The particular object for their focus is the East River Colorado watershed, a roughly 300 square kilometer mountainous head water area, which they view as a quote, test bed through which to explore how watershed changes impact down gradient water, down gradient water availability and quality. In case this word is new to you, a watershed is a land area that channels rainfall and snowmelt to creek streams and rivers, and eventually to outflow points such as reservoirs, underground aquifers, bays and the ocean. A watershed can be relatively small, I'm sure many in the audience are familiar with the Tomales Drake's watershed north of Marin, if you've ever visited Point Reyes uh, National Seashore. Um, and if you've ever been to Crested Butte, Colorado, then you have been inside the watershed that the Brody Lab is analyzing. Now, when I'm describing objects of synthetic biology, the size of its unit object, a cell, is small although the representatively interactive elements of which it's dynamically composed also present with a wide range of relative scales, from atoms to molecules to membranes to microbes like E. coli and unicellular organisms like yeasts. But the relative range and scale for an object of biogeochemically oriented earth system sciences like the watershed is dizzying. From the microscopic to the mountainous, the physical scales of watershed systems run from the genomic soil microbiota, to the hydrological, river force and flow, to the meteorological, precipitation producing barometric pressure systems, to the atmospheric. We're talking the wind-whipped weathering of rock, ravine, and crag. And the corresponding motley of earth, climate, physical, and life sciences called upon to model, to measure, and to analyze the dynamic interactions that shape such a multi-scalar heterogeneous aggregation that a watershed is 
are as eclectic as the elements and entities comprising it. Biogeochemistry already nominally proffers a terminological collapse of the biological, chemical, and geological sciences. You see it in name, but it's not just a name only. In the watershed system alone, Biology refers to soil microbiology and the metagenomics of watershed microbiota and metabolites from riverbeds to rock faces. The biological extends further to the botany of vegetation gradients, the forestry of interspecies tree groves, and the mycology of mycorrhizal mutuality, those networks of connections between fungi with the root systems of plants. Geology comprises terrestrial forces forging landscapes admixtures of rock, the fluvial geomorphology of river show, flows physically shaping the earth, and the physical dynamics of hydrological force, its chemical composition in a river, and the river's deposition of elemental trace metals, ores, and vital compounds like dissolved organic carbon. That the biogeochemistry of earth science systems aims to take analytical account of such an integrated, if infinitely variable, complex of dynamically equilibrious earthen agencies is itself of supreme interest for the horror. For if their object is create, to create a way to predictively model the composite dynamics of biogeochemical with hydrological interactions in a watershed, one of the hearth cluster's primary objects here is to culture a planetary perspective to the human and the earth by engaging the Brody Brody Group's biogeochemistry of Earth systems as a philosophical laboratory. From a hearth point of view, where current transformations of the human nature and technology are always at the fore, we're interested in the ways that the biogeochemistry of Earth systems currently conceives the human as either a physical part of, or at least an agentive force for Earth systems like the watershed. The main question, therefore, that's framed Nina's initial inquiry into the Brody Lab's work is, quote, to quote her, how is the human integrated now and how could the human become integrated into the biogeochemistry of a watershed system? This question is so vital for the cluster because there's an implicit concept of the human between the lines of biogeochemical earth science. And this concept is of the modernist mode of a separation of human from nature or earth. There's currently three ways of, in Tobias Reese's words, doing human to which biogeochemistry explicitly gives form. First, there's a scientific human subject that observes, measures, models, quantifies, takes up the watershed as an object. Second, there's a figure of the human as an anthropogenic agent who on the one hand consumes resources like water and energy and therefore needs the watershed system as a natural resource for sustenance. And then on the other hand has as human in the aggregate, been a central force for accelerating the very climactic changes that increase and intensify those perturbations which are endangering the subsistence of watershed systems specifically, as well as the earth and atmospheric systems more generally that we rely upon for the near future. The concepts of human implied in both of these cases is one that is separate from the earth outside of nature. The human appears either as a scientific student of the phenomena of nature or as an agent of nature's anthropocenic destruction and waste. Lastly, as with conservation biology, biodiversity movements and ecological science more broadly, as well as activism, the DOE funded biogeochemists implicitly propose an image of the human as an environmental steward, a custodial role relative to earth and nature, the human as resource manager. No qualms here, of course, with that perspective and practice. I think those values we share. However, the caring custodian that tends to nature is not necessarily a part of it or it a part of them. So the challenge with biogeochemistry remains how to bring the earth and the human together to forge a planetary perspective for figuring a flourishing future for earth, us and others together. Earth science holds much promise for this perspectival philosophical work. Between the metagenomics of the watershed's soil microbiome and its mycorrhizal mutuality of fungal and plant root networks and relations, there appears the third candidate field for the hearth cluster's ambitions to articulate a planetary perspective. The microbial and the fungal figure prominently into the thinking and the technology that's being actualized through synthetic biology as well at both its basic science as well as its commercially applied venues. 
From synthetic biology to biogeochemical earth science, the microbiome domain seems to truly offer an essential opening for imagining a planetary integration of the human with nature or the earth and for materializing natural biotechnologies that encourage engineering as a human practice in collaboration with nature. The hearth is in its infancy, however, but as our probings become partnerships and then concrete projects, artists will be key to securing not only a vision for, but an experience of a planetary perspective to the human and the earth um, tomorrow. And we're very excited about that. And the next time uh, I have the opportunity to address um, you, I look forward to um, sharing what kinds of uh, artistic collaborations and also uh, further forays with um, these field sites um, come to fruition. Thank you for your attention today and um, also for the opportunity to do this research. Cheers.